Let's call this meeting. Mayor Mancarelli? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Orr? Here. Councilman Blair? Here. Councilman Good? Here. Councilman Lamerson? Here. Councilwoman Scholl? Here. Councilman Sishka? Here. All are present. Thank you. This is a study session of the Press City Council days to do Tuesday, May 8th, 2018. And we're going to hear from Mr. Woodfill regarding some proposed changes to the procurement code. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Mark Woodfill, Budget and Finance Director. Uh, today we're going to talk about some proposed changes to the procurement code. So the procurement code uh, governs how the city uh, procures all the products, all the contracts, everything we do to fulfill the, the demands of the citizens. The current procurement code base structure was adopted back in 94. We've made a lot of minor changes over the years as things have changed. Um, this is probably one of the more major changes that we've done, and we've done that to try to clarify a lot of the areas. Uh, we decentralized purchasing um, back in about 2012, and as part of that, the, uh, I guess the enforcement of the procurement code, which was done in purchasing, went to finance because we issued the POs. So before we issue POs, we make sure that everything is complied with in the procurement code and all the required approvals are obtained. Uh, basically, with the decentralization, department heads, city manager, and department heads all became the procurement officers for our respected areas. Um, as opposed to a citywide procurement officer. As far as internal controls and the requirements that we place on purchases, we require uh, multiple approvals from the department, at least two approvals. A lot of departments, we work with the departments to get as many approvals as they want, but as long as they have the minimal where somebody acknowledges receipt of the product and a supervisor acknowledges that it is within the scope of the budget and the scope of the purpose. So that's just a little background on our procurement code. As we look at our proposed changes, our goals here were to improve accountability and uh, competitiveness in city procurements, and we're doing that through more efficiency. Uh, right now, the procurement code, as it's written, there's a lot of vague areas in it uh, where all these individual purchasing directors across the city, it's not real clear. So we wanted to clarify a lot of that language. We wanted to streamline the process um, to try to increase bidders, increase um, uh, competition in our procurement, uh, reducing the time in the steps of the procurement. And again, a lot of it is to get more people to bid so we can have smaller companies, local companies, be able to bid on things that right now they're like, well, it's a lot of work to bid for the city. It takes three months to get it approved. It, you know, it, it's a lot of, lot of steps. Uh, we aren't, it's not worth our time. We're not going to do it. So the city ends up having to go to the Valley and other big cities um, for a lot of the products that we need. We're trying to change that a little bit. <laughs> Uh, so, and we also wanted to update the terminology and uh, talk about the new procurement methods that are out there, the construction manager at risk, those type of things. We wanted to include references to that in the code. So the changes uh, deal with uh, these four primary areas. We added a few sections uh, and expanded a lot of others to clarify, but the big areas were sole source procurement. It was not really well defined in the previous code. We've um, in Included more on that. Uh, there are a lot of um, exemptions from the bidding. None of them really spelled out in the code, um, but it's, well, legally there's no way to do it, or you can't do it because of this or because of that. So it was left to a lot of discretion. We felt it was important to get a clear list so everybody is clear on what doesn't need to be bid and what does need to be bid. Uh, we included the new procurement types. We updated the procurement methods, the dollar levels for those methods, and we also are proposing an update, an, um, a change in the council level of approval, and we'll talk about that. So sole source, this is when there's no competition, so there's no way to get competitive bids. Um, so this is an exemption from the procurement methods, but when is that allowed? Um, what are the requirements? And, we could spend a lot of time going over what we've seen in the last six years as we've been doing this, but basically we wanted to outline specifically what a department needs 
to justify before they can call it a sole source. Um, they got to explain why there is no other material. You know, why is it only that type of cinder that we can use? Uh, what efforts did you, what efforts did the Department of the Procurement Officer do to make sure there was no other way we could bid whatever it was, uh, couldn't go with another vendor? And we also uh, are requiring them to provide some material, letter, whatever from the vendor of the product that they're the sole source because of this or because of that. So we're asking for more documentation. Again, all this is only done once they substantiate it and then it's approved by the city manager. Again, a list of exemptions from the bidding. When do we not do competitive bidding? And again, it's a list and right in the code we say, this doesn't preclude a department or procurement officer from bidding it when possible, and that should happen. If it is possible, even if it is a professional service, they should bid it. But there are reasons that you need that particular attorney or you need that particular um, CPA firm or whatever, that particular insurance company. Um, so there are reasons that uh, that may be needed, but it should be bid whenever possible. Uh, obviously, if there's a grant donation that specify a specific thing, somebody gave the city money to buy a John Deere tractor, well, that you wouldn't have to bid because it was specified in the granting, uh, that type of stuff. Those are obviously exclusions, work of arts, entertainment things when there's a, a reason that you can't really bid it. Um, intergovernmental payments, purchase agreements, again, you, you can't really bid intergovernmental cooperation. Uh, Mark, membership this, dues and travel. Is this an example of when, like, we source Glendale's uh, contracts? Somewhere? No, that's a joint purchasing agreement. This would be uh, a uh, joining the Yavapai Water Association or something. You can't bid to join different water associations that are a government. Or working on an agreement with Prescott Valley to do something. It, it's not when we um, piggyback on another city's procurement method. Mark, I think Councilman Lamerson has a question, comment. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what happens if the council determines we don't need the deduction to begin with, we don't need a John Deere tractor, and um, somebody's just looking to use the council to get a tax deduction? What happens, you know, you know, not everything that somebody wants to give the city is something that we want to take. Well, the donate, ooh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. The donations are governed by a different policy. Um, there's a donation policy of when a donation need, can be accepted by the city, when it needs to be accepted by the council, that type of thing. That's really not what we're talking about. This would be if there was a grant or something that required a specific um, purchase of something. Uh, example, Motorola radios, a uh, grant from Motorola to buy Motorola radios or something. I mean, we're not talking about the donations policy of the city uh, today. We're yeah, talking I can about just the answer. If somebody, obviously, a grant and a donation are different. All the grant, almost almost all the grants we apply for go through council. So if you're going to choose not to approve the application of the grant or the subsequent acceptance of the grants, that that was those steps would occur first before the mandatory purchase would 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 be required. Same with the donation. If somebody wanted to donate something to the city, McCormick Building, we could say, well, we're going to turn that down. You, you don't have to accept the donation from an individual or an organization if you think it's in the best interest of the city to turn it down. Thank you for pointing that out. Sometimes there's more of a liability to accept in a grant or donation than what it's worth. Um, and going on down the list, we have membership dues, travel, obviously those are specific to different things, not really a biddable. Advertising, a lot of times advertisements are trying to be placed in particular markets. There's really not a way to bid these things. Um, resale to the public, that is an exclusion when we uh, was put in the code. We kept it in the code in case since we still technically own the golf course, but when you have a retail establishment like a pro shop, uh, you need to carry a particular brand of golf clubs. You can't really bid um, any particular brand. Uh, public utility, uh, purchase of water, power. When we buy water and power from APS, we really can't bid a, a different power company. They're essentially monopolies governed by the Corporation Commission. 
And of course, development agreements have certain requirements in them. And when we uh, purchase real property, you, you have title companies, but you end up with title insurance and things like that, which are uh, can't really be bid. So those are the exemptions that we've put into the code. And again, if council has an issue with any, any of them, obviously we can remove any of them, or if you think of another one you'd like to add. But those are the ones we came up with looking at the last seven years of trying to enforce the existing procurement code. Looking at the procurement method, currently uh, purchases up to $3,000 um, are done with as much economy as practical. Then we have required written quotes between $3,000 and $20,000, and then formal sealed bids above uh, $20,000. We have a survey here of, of several cities, and we're proposing to up those limits to be more comparable to the other cities we see out there. The up to $5,000 in the first one, written quotes from five to 50, this will definitely help um, spur involvement of local vendors. A formal sealed bidding process is a complicated process and not undertaken by people that don't do it every day. Obviously, big contractors in town do it all the time, not a deep, big deal, but when you're trying to do something else, it's harder. We up this from 10,000 to 20,000 in 2012, I recall, and um, it, it helped um, spur in um, purchasing from local vendors. A lot more local vendors were a lot more willing to give you a written quote than do a sealed bid for a $20,000 project. So we're proposing to take that to 50, which is in line with the other cities um, that were surveyed. And we do not accept verbal quotes um, as some of the cities currently do. Any questions on those levels? Any issues with any of those levels? No, the only, <clears throat> the only problem that I have because of the business that I'm in is the fact that when there's a window covering project within the city of Prescott and there's bids that are submitted to three different companies, <laughs> it doesn't specify the quality or type <laughs> of window covering that the city's looking for. So therefore, it leaves those quotes, those bids open from China to Mexico to United States from one manufacturer to another. And the problem that I have is the city then buys whatever's low, and it could be the worst product in the market just to say we got the low. And it could be from China or it could be from Mexico and you're replacing that within a couple of years. So when you start talking about certain things like what I'm doing, I think it should be specified what we're looking for. Because if it's not, you never know what you're gonna get. And you can get it from Kmart, you can get it from Walmart, you can get plastic to, to the Cadillac. So it's very difficult for somebody like me bidding on a project not knowing what I'm bidding against. Great point, Councilman. And uh, that's really, um, you know, and, and that is really something that we need to deal with our procurement officers across the city. That's one problem with the decentralized procurement. Um, when you have a centralized purchasing office that does the procurement, they're knowledgeable about those sort of things and they make sure that those specifications are in the bid request um, or the um, written quote request. Uh, but when you're dealing with people that don't normally buy blinds um, and, you know, I just don't want the sun coming in that window, I need blinds, and you get a bid out there like that, that's where you run into those problems. And the worst part about it, I guess, is, I suppose, take City Hall and you've got five different bids you put out over the last five years. There are five different companies, five different products, five different warranties, and the city's not protected by any of them. So they're sole proprietor you know, bids that they make the stuff on site, and if they die or go away, the, the, the city and the taxpayers aren't protected. So the only thing I'd ask is the fact that back in the day when there was a, a, a purchasing office, they would specify level or Hunter Douglas and or equal, whatever the case may be, for a two-year contract, three-year contract, it's a sealed bid. <clears throat> The clerk o o opens it, and you know for the next two to three years, or whatever the case may be, that anything that comes up within the city's realm of purchasing window coverings, you know who's going to get that. So you take away all the guesswork, and you have specific lifetime warranties on products that you know aren't going to fail. 
I, I think suggestion. Mandating the folks doing the purchasing in each of the departments understands the importance of specificity. Yeah. It's something that we need to work on. Definitely. Because I think you're right. When you lose the centralized purchasing, you lose one person making sure that happens. Well, you see often, standing at the podium or over here, where the Joe Baines will show up and say, we want a tractor for the golf course, but we want Massey Ferguson and all the other ones don't meet our requirements. So they, we do do that on a regular and, basis. And because we should, because it, there's instances where that makes total sense. Because when you start talking about maintenance and everything else to that product. You want to have a single vendor you're dealing with. Well, there you go. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, yes, kind of speaks to this. So Mark, you and I were talking, and you were saying that you are actually studying, thinking about whether or not centralized rather than, de I, I usually am a fan of decentralization, but, um, but one of the things this is going to bring us is some more efficiency. And sometimes if you centralize, you can lose some of that efficiency. So, um, uh, but you're studying that, right? You're gonna well, think about as you go forward? We definitely have been looking at the procurement process of the city, um, and we've had, uh, over the last few years I've been around, um, we've had di several different formats of that. We've had full-blown, um, purchasing departments with the director, secretarial staff, buyers, uh, warehouse, the whole thing, <laughs> to the point that we were just one single buyer or purchasing yeah. director, although there was only one of them, um, who kind of coordinated things. So we've done it a couple different ways. So we are looking at the purchasing process. We're trying to improve it and make it more efficient. Step one to that was looking at this procurement code, mm -hmm. getting that cleaned up, um, not I'm not convinced that going to another procurement department is the right solution. Yeah. Uh, we're getting this in place. We're reviewing contracts right now. We're doing audits on contracts and working with departments to clean up cellular phones and APS meters and that kind of stuff. We're cleaning up the procurement process. And then once we get through that, I think we'll have a lot better handle on what would make the most sense for the city and the most effective way to do it. Well, I, I think this is, I, I really welcome this. I think it's going to really speed up the process. Right now, something that costs $20,000, you've got to come to council. So you got to, that, that, it takes weeks. It takes a month. <laughs> Thank at you. At least a month <laughs> yeah. um, to get it done. And that's our last area, is council uh, approval levels. Hey, Mark. Uh, yes, sir. Councilman Lamerson has a call. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to chime in on part of what Blair was talking about with bid specifications. Um, I think it has to be very explicit, and I think it has to be on an equal playing field. And I really think that we need to be a little better, that being the city, and the specifications that we put out there so the vendors that are bidding know exactly what we're looking for. I don't necessarily think that our specifications, whether it's to the contractors or whether it's to the people that come in and want to do this, this, or this with regards to the things we're asking for, get a clear picture of what the city actually wants. So I really think that within our procurement code is where it lays. And if, if indeed it's the procurement code we're gonna depend on for everybody being treated the same, it needs to be fairly explicit. You know, if you want green, say I want green. Definitely, Council. And we can, uh, and again, there was a draft procurement code uh, attached to this agenda item. Um, with direction from this meeting, we'll, we'll bring forward wherever Council wants, and we can add more wording in there to make sure that uh, specifications are in the bid, the bids are have sufficient specifications to meet the needs of the city. We'll make sure that that's in there. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Uh, the, like I said, the last slide is the budget level. Currently, we're at twenty uh, or at ten thousand. Um, Prescott Valley is at sixteen. We're proposing twenty-five. As you can see, the other cities there. You have a Pike County. Actually, once the budget's adopted, it does not require the departments to come back for the purchase of anything, um, unless there's a, a, a legal contract involved in it that requires that. Uh, they delegate all that authority. Um, just a, a point of note, uh, back in 2011, the city was at 20,000. And at, at a budget workshop, Councilman Lamerson Blair may remember, there was discussion that they wanted, council wanted to have a better handle on what the city was buying, that type of stuff. So we lowered it to 10, 
you know, and the discussion was for a time type of thing. <laughs> um, moving it from 10 to 25 would actually reduce the number of items on an agenda. About 65 items last year wouldn't have had to be on an agenda. Could have been purchased in a reasonable period of time as opposed to month and a half or so that it takes to get the bid. You can put the specs out, get the bids back in, get it on an agenda, and get it through council. And I'd point out, and I'd, I'd, I'd look to uh, the uh, city attorney, but as I recall, since 2011 when it was changed, I didn't recall council ever turning down any of those ten to $20,000 purchases. They, yes, sir. I think one of the mind thoughts at the time, as I remember it, was the simple fact that we had people in place at that point in time where the council didn't trust their spending. Plus, it was a time of the downturn in the economy where even though it was approved in the budget, we wanted to look at it and see if we could do away with that so we could save money because of the downturn in the economy. So that was twofold why that happened. That to this day, with the management that we have in place and with the economy we have in place, I would say it's fair to move it to 25, but buyer beware that that might change again in the future because, again, if it was in, in your budget to have something spent for $20,000 and times got tough, we had to look at you when it came to us and say, can you put that off for another year or can you just spend 10? So we were able to save money doing it that way, as I recall. So. Just, just a thought. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, in the dollar changes, it's a moving target with the economy. You know, what was good for 10 grand 20 years ago, 10 years ago, isn't relevant today. Things change. And, and I would just point out, Mayor Council, that that the per, that generally speaking, other than sort of professional services, it's still lowest responsible bidder. So if we get three quotes or we get, if it's over 50, assuming these numbers get approved, it still has to go to lowest responsible bidder. And as you spec things out, I think what we can look at in the language of the code is, is the, the, the factors that go into the purchase. In other words, sometimes you just want the cheapest product out there. Sometimes you want warranties. Sometimes you want lifespan. Sometimes you want a certain quality for some other reason. So those are the factors, I think, that need to go into the SPACs. We have to be somewhat careful not to sort of drive that you can't SPAC out something and essentially make it sole source, you know, because when, when you, it's, the SPACs are so detailed that you, you create a sole source type purchase. So there's, a, there's sort of a, a tightrope you walk on it, but <coughs> I think by just because it doesn't require a second level of council approval, it's already, the numbers are budgeted, the dollars are budgeted. Mm -hmm. It still has to be, it has to still comply with procurement code. And there are checks and balances, finance, legal, city manager, that if someone starts abusing the code and, um, and making purchases that don't go to council, there's still recourse against those employees or that employee that, that abuses the procurement process, even if it doesn't go to council. And I, can t and I would agree with Mark. I, I, don't, I don't recall the ten to $20,000 purchases. Every once in a while, they may get pulled off a consent agenda and the questions asked about them, but inevitably they get approved. So it's somewhat of a formality, I think, currently. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you. Um, thanks, John, for bringing that up. I do think, though, it's up to the magnificent seven that's sitting up here to decide what we would call a responsible bidder. We're the ones that set that criteria. We're the ones that are responsible to the taxpayer in the city of Prescott for putting that in the procurement code as to what we want to define as a responsible bidder. And sometimes just because you're the cheapest doesn't mean you're the most responsible. It just means you're the cheapest. Clearly, and, and again, we have the standards and I think they're still in this code as to what responsible bidder. Again, there's, remember there's two. There's a responsive. If we have certain standards for blinds and, and uh, inspect out and a bidder goes in and inspects out something that doesn't meet any of the standards, they're not even responsive to the bid, right? And then responsible is what's your history with the city, what's your history with other cities. We're looking at references from other projects that are similar. Uh, are you are you in a dispute with the city? I mean, we look at all those things to deem someone responsible or not responsible before we go through. And that happens more in the public works realm. 
or happens more often, I should say. But yeah, you're right. We look, we have those standards laid out in the procurement code to, to sort of, the, I think it's how many factors were there? 11? It's, I don't know. 13, yeah. 13 different factors that go to whether someone's responsible or not. So we're not looking for the cheapest product, right? Or the lowest bidder. It's lowest responsible, responsive bidder. Councilman Blair. Yeah, I don't have a problem with 25. I, I think as Jim said, the dollar moves. But one thing we always have, we have that filter that numerous times we'll get on our consent agenda items that are 100,000 plus, and we have the opportunity as a council to pull them off the consent agenda. So, I mean, if it's a, a tough time or we disagree with the department or whatever the case may be, we still have that opportunity to say, let's talk about this. Well, and I think staff understands that as the economy changes, if you want to have increased oversight, you could always go down. But this is a good threshold that I think is worth supporting. Councilman Good. My concern um, may be in the past looking at the uh, things that had been approved, and generally they are almost exclusively, um, it does require that staff bring those issues to the council, justify those costs, and when they're properly justified, they get, they get approved. Uh, if we have a larger blanket um, uh, non-review threshold, then maybe some of those um, uh, wants rather than needs would be passed through without ever getting a, a review and justification. Um, I know not too long ago we looked at uh, one of the software programs where it appeared that, you know, a, a bid went out, a bare-bones software platform was approved, and then over a course of years, um, additional modules were added to it to the point where it had far exceeded the original uh, cost of uh, the estimate of running those software programs. Um, I could see a situation like this happening where you have a particular issue that is added to uh, 25000 dollars at a time and before you know it you've got a, a quarter million dollar uh, issue that has never really been uh, reviewed by council so I agree that um, the current level 10,000 is probably uh, too low for normal operating um, needs uh, but a number higher uh, it can be justified whether 25 is the right number you know maybe I think maybe 20 probably also would be a good number. So the only question is, what's the good number? Just, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to follow on uh, good points, um, Councilman Good. But just to clarify, all purchases are reviewed and scrutinized. Um, you know, just because they don't come to council doesn't mean they aren't reviewed. Um, they are reviewed by the department, and they're also review, reviewed by finance. And, and we also tell you that you know, we, we, we're pretty strict on bid splitting. In other words, <laughs> there are, the, there are, <laughs> you can set up bid where it's uh, 17 very low dollar amounts. It's really one, really one procurement. So we look at those things. If there seems to be a pattern of a bunch of purchases that are relatively low to amount, we're going to sit there and go, is that, have they been bid splitting? you know, to avoid either, you know, the, the procurement process, council approval process. And, you, and those, and those are pretty, uh, most of those are pretty obvious to find. And we actively look for those, and we call departments on it. I was seeing if there's anybody here who wants to <laughs> testify to that. But. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Sishka. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just something short. I know it's apples and oranges, but uh, Flagstaff and Sedona are both over 50,000. And so uh, I think 25000 is probably very reasonable. Mayor Pro Tem? You know, I think with the efficiency also comes more competition because we're going to get more bidders. In, in the material I read, it indicates that. Yeah. And local bidders, which I really welcome, that we can maybe give some businesses to, to local folks. That, so I think this is, this is a good move. And I, I think the dollar amounts are right. Um, so thank you. Anything else? No, uh, we will bring the procurement code with the increased, uh, we'll, we'll work on the requirements of uh, spe specificity in the bidding, or the, or the quotes, and we'll bring that back at the next council. Well, Mark, I think that also gets to training the people. When you have a decentralized 
procurement process, everybody in every department that's doing it needs to understand the importance. And we probably need to ratchet up the training. I don't think there's any doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, and we do do training uh, as we can. Again, staff, staff time is always pulled in a lot of directions, but we will uh, reiterate that to the procurement managers who are your department heads. Excuse me, Mark. Uh, can you, you know, I noticed in, on the computer here I couldn't get any of this information here. Um, at least could on the next time when you bring it to council, could you highlight what you're changing? Um, in the procurement know? code? Yeah. The, the changes were so significant uh, that uh, it made it pretty much unreadable. Oh, yeah. um, okay. Uh, so uh, so I, can, I can give you the new code. I can give you this PowerPoint, uh, which kind of outlines the significant changes. Well, if you could include the PowerPoint in the information we have that we can get on our computers. Okay. That would be awesome. <laughs> sure, I'll email, I'll email that to all, all of you guys. Any other questions or comments for Mark? I am not disappointed that you didn't take the full hour. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Nothing else on the agenda. This meeting's adjourned.